This lesson is all about mollusks. Um, by the end of the lesson, I'd like you to be able to do two things for me. First, I'd like you to be able to describe the main characteristics of mollusks, what sets them apart from other animals. And then secondly, I'd like you to be able to identify the major groups of mollusks. There will be three groups we'll talk about today. Um, pay attention to the characteristics that set these groups apart from one another. All mollusks are invertebrates. That means that they don't have um, a backbone. It means that they don't have a spinal cord like you and I. They do, however, have soft bodies that are protected by hard outer shells. Now, our segmented worms from chapter one had soft bodies as well, um, but those soft bodies were segmented, meaning that we saw repeated body patterns happening over and over and over within the same organism. Mollusks don't have this segmentation, so that's one way that they are a bit different from our um, segmented worms. All mollusks, as we said before, have a hard outer shell. Just inside of that shell, there is a structure called the mantle. The mantle is a thin layer of tissue um, that covers all of the internal organs inside of the mollusk. Um, it's also in charge of producing new layers of shell. As the old shell wears away, the mantle is producing new shell to take its place. Just like our worms, mollusks have bilateral symmetry. We are dealing here with a more complex organism um, than we were before. So these mollusks, in addition to having bilateral symmetry and a shell and a mantle, also have a specific organ called a kidney. Um, and you and I have kidneys too. They're internal organs that remove waste produced in animal cells. In our case, our kidneys um, filter our blood and they remove any waste products or toxins found in our blood and then excrete those from the body through the urinary system. Most mollusks, notice not all, but most mollusks have a muscular foot. They have organs called gills that help them to remove oxygen from water. Remember, uh, before the science fair, we talked a lot about how oxygen is important for cells to be able to make energy. Most mollusks also have a um, organelle or organ called a radula. This is a flexible ribbon that's got lots and lots of tiny teeth built into it, sometimes up to 250,000 teeth. And these teeth, when you put them all together, act like a sandpaper of sorts. And they, um, mollusks use their radula to scrape food from a surface. So they might use it to remove parts of a leaf. They might use it to pull moss off of a rock. Um, not all mollusks have a radula, but a number of them do. Another trait that most mollusks share is that they live in water. If they don't live in a body of water itself, they need to live near water, so they might live in an area that's marshy um, or in an area that's usually damp. Clams, snails, squids, oysters, scallops, octopi, all of those organisms that you see in the picture on the screen are examples of mollusks. There's evidence to support the theory that mollusks have been around for a really, really, really long time. And the reason that scientists feel comfortable projecting that is because we see evidence of mollusks in limestone that we know to be really old. Um, when you see evidence of an organism in limestone or in another rock from a different period of time, we call that evidence a fossil. Um, it's just an impression that's left behind, a cast or a mold that's left behind as um, sediment piled on top of a hard structure like a shell. Um, we aren't going to see fossils of soft tissue. Um, because tissue breaks down over time. These shells that mollusks usually have um, are made of a substance that takes much longer to decompose. So if it gets covered before it's finished decomposing, it will likely leave behind a fossil. Now mollusks are going to be classified by physical characteristics, things like a presence of a shell. Some, most mollusks have a shell, but there are a few examples of mollusks that don't. The type of shell that a mollusk possesses will also be a way that they're classified. The type of foot that a mollusk has is important. Um, the arrangement of teeth on a radula, or even the presence of a radula altogether. And then lastly, the complexity of a nervous system. Some mollusks have a very complex nervous system. Um, they are super smart, smarter than most animals that we observe in nature. Um, others, not so much. The three basic groups of mollusks are called gastropods, bivalves, and cephalopods. Now, these are the names of the phyla. Remember, on our last quiz, you had to list the names of these 
um, animals by their phyla. So if you don't have this information in your notes, please pause the video, go back and add that so you have it for your open note quiz. The three major groups are phyla of mollusks are called gastropods, bivalves, and cephalopods. Gastropods are mollusks that will have a single shell or sometimes no shell at all. They're the most numerous group of mollusks, meaning that the there are more are more gastropods out there than any other kind of mollusk. Um, slugs and snails are included in this category. Now we know snails always have a shell. Slugs, not so much. So that's why you see that distinction between having a shell and not having a shell in the definition. One thing that all mollusks, or gastropods rather, have in common is that they creep along on a broad foot. The word gastropod literally means stomach foot. So they crawl along on their stomach, on their bellies, but that organism or organ that they're using to crawl is a foot. Kind of weird. Gastropods, like slugs and snails, can be found almost anywhere on Earth. Um, they are going to obtain their food in a variety of ways. Sometimes they're herbivores, sometimes they're scavengers, other times they're actually going to hunt prey and we call them carnivores. Um, one interesting thing about snails in particular, because they have this shell, they're able to use it to help escape predators. Their uh, shells have a tight-fitting plate or a trap door of sorts that will seal off the shell, pulling the body inside from the outside world. Um, if a snail feels threatened, it will oftentimes recoil back into its shell, and it can live inside of its shell for a really, really long time. There was a neat experiment done, or observation, that was made a number of years back um, where a shell was collected and they thought it was empty. Um, it sat on a shelf for almost four years, and then when they put it back in the water four years later, the snail popped out. Pretty amazing. This Exploring the Snail photo was in your book, um, and it outlined some of the most important parts of a snail's anatomy. You'll notice that the snail has um, a headward region, and um, that is where a lot of the sense organs, such as the mouth and the eyes, are located. Um, the snail also has an interesting set of organs called tentacles, and these tentacles um, can be extended or contracted. They're actually used for taste. So even though the snail has a mouth, it's not tasting food or other things in its environment through its mouth. It's tasting as well as touching through those tentacles near the top of its head. Um, if we move our way um, back, so posterior on the snail, you'll come across the shell and you notice inside the shell there's that blue organ called the mantle. Um, the snail does have a heart, just like our earthworms had hearts in chapter one. Um, there's also a stomach. You notice the connection between the mouth and the stomach, all a part of the digestive system. Um, there's a radula just inside of the mouth as well, which helps with processing food um, and breaking it down mechanically. And then lastly, along the bottom of the snail, you'll notice that muscular foot that the snail uses to move. The next group or phyla of mollusks are called bivalves. The word or the prefix bi means two. If you think about a bicycle having two wheels or someone that's bilingual is speaking two languages. A bivalve is a mollusk that has two shells. Bi, two, valve actually meaning shell. Clams, oysters, scallops, and mussels are all examples of bivalves. Every bivalve will have two shells and those shells are going to be held together by um, strong muscles that collapse a hinge joint. Um, unlike our gastropods on the last slide, Bivalves do not have a radula. They're not going to scrape food off of a hard surface. Instead, they're filter feeders. They're going to use their gills not only to breathe, but also to draw food into their bodies. Sort of like the sponges we talked about in chapter one. They're gonna use those gills, not the osculum, to draw food into their body. Um, and then they're going to sort of separate the food from the oxygen once it's within themselves, and then use it to produce energy. Sometimes, however, things get gunked up. Grit gets stuck in between those two shells, those bivalves and the mantle, which is in charge of producing new shell. When this happens, the bivalve is going to produce a pearly coat to cover the irritant to try to stop it from um, getting in the way of all of the essential functions that the animal's trying to undergo. And that pearly coat after it's been added on to layer after layer after layer, is going to form a pearl, like the pearls that we see used in jewelry today. There is a video on this slide. I'll post the link to the video um, on my website under today's homework so that you can go back and watch it. It's all about how pearls are formed. Kind of interesting. The last 
phyla or group of mollusks are cephalopods. These are our mollusks with tentacles. Um, they're pretty interesting. They have these tentacles in the place of a muscular foot, and the tentacles actually surround their mouth. We would think the tentacles would be on the back end of the organism. They're actually on the front. Octopi, cuttlefish, squids are all examples of cephalopods. Squids and cuttlefish will have shells, like most mollusks do. However, octopi do not. Interestingly enough, um, sort of like our slugs from the gastropod slide, octopi do not have shells. All cephalopods, however, are going to capture food using muscular tentacles. On those tentacles, there are these very sensitive suckers um, that have the ability to respond to information in a variety of ways. They're able to take chemical signals from the water and um, use those to respond to stimuli. Um, they're also able to direct sensations of taste and touch. So through this one organelle, the sucker on the um, cephalopod's tentacle. It can sense chemical changes in the water, it can sense taste, and it can sense touch. Speaking of senses, cephalopods also have large eyes and excellent vision. So far we have encountered a lot of organisms that can maybe barely see um, or can only sense light even. Here we have a group of organisms, still invertebrates, still pretty simple, but with large eyes and excellent vision. This is because cephalopods have the most complex brain and nervous system of any invertebrate on planet Earth. Um, they are able to respond and problem solve in some pretty remarkable ways. You'll notice there's a video on this slide as well. Um, sort of freaky. It's about how octopi can take on and eat sharks. Um, but take a look at that on my website as well. I'll post the link along with some other neat videos about um, cephalopods and some of the cool things that they're able to do. Um, cephalopods also live in the ocean. We're not going to find them um, moving between the ocean and land. They swim using a um, technique called jet propulsion where they basically suck water up into themselves and then they squirt it out um, sort of like, I don't know, um, water in a water gun and as, as that water pushes out away from the organism, it propels the organism forward. So that would be jet propulsion. For today, um, you need to finish up your section 2.1 notes. Remember that those are due today at 2 p.m. Um, there's also a feedback form on my website that I'd like you to complete. It just asks a few simple questions about how things are going, um, what you think went well this week, and what we can improve. That way, when we come back after spring break, we can maybe make some changes and make the class more accessible for everybody. Please let me know if you have any questions. Have a good day.